Good evening. Welcome to InfoFit's Nutrition Truth and Lies Lecture. My name is Kathy Glennon. I will be host, your host this evening. This evening, we have Sydney Schindel with us. Sydney is a certified sports nutritional practitioner and the course instructor for InfoFit's Certified Sports Performance and Fitness Nutrition Specialist Program. She will be answering all of your questions at the end of the webinar via the chat box. So anything you ask during the webinar will be answered at that time. If it's relevant to the particular slide that we're looking at, I will try and interject in between. So feel free to ask questions at any time. I'd like to warmly welcome, uh, introduce Sydney. Welcome, Sydney. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks for having me here. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, I definitely can. Um, to start, uh, prior to my education in nutrition, I was actually a former national level synchronized swimmer. I coached for 10 years after that at a national level. So coaching and sport is a huge part of my life. I grew up uh, in and around the sports nutrition scene, understanding why that was important to make my body move, what made me feel good, what made me uh, question things in terms of nutrition. And I kind of took that into the realm of cooking and baking for a while. I experimented in my kitchen, found my way into some uh, restaurant kitchens as well, and was still not satisfied with my answers. So I took that knowledge of uh, the sports that I had and the experience in the pool, combined that with my love of cooking and baking, and found my way into the realm of sports nutrition and nutrition in general. I'm currently a certified nutritional practitioner or a holistic nutritionist. I own my own company called Veritas Wellness in Vancouver, uh, where I work with clients one-on-one, -on -one, uh, as well as doing a lot of talks around the city in the corporate setting. Uh, and I also teach sports nutrition for InfoFit. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so tonight, um, we will be covering um, some of these topics, as well as a few others. So we're going to be covering a better understanding of the top nutritional truths and lies permeating throughout the fitness industry. We're going to have some clarification of nutritional buzzwords used on food labels such as vegan, organic, gluten-free, healthy, natural, and a few more. We're going to have some greater insight regarding the food industry and the government as it regulates the uh, regu relates to regulation and standardization of food labeling practices. A check a list of so-called healthy foods that can actually wreak havoc on your system. The ability to read proper uh, properly food labels. The pros and cons of the Nutrition Canada Food Guide. The new one that just came out so uh, mm -hmm. we'll be taking a closer look at that and we're also going to have some clarifications as what to um, you as fitness professionals can and cannot do regarding nutritional advice mm -hmm. so sydney what are the top nutrition nutritional lies now permeating throughout the food industry so to get us started i kind of wanted to start with just some of the buzzwords that are out there. And I wouldn't necessarily say that that is a, a straight up lie. It's more so that it's a marketing scheme. And as we all know, we live in a world where everything and anything is marketable. And that includes all the food that we eat on a regular basis or we're consuming. If you think to your Instagram or to your advertising on TV, everything is shiny uh, and delicious, be it healthy or, or not healthy. And in the world of healthy eating, there's some buzzwords that are out there right now that we need to cover and kind of discuss. And so when we're looking at those big buzzwords, the main ones out there these days are things like vegan, plant-based, gluten-free, organic, natural, healthy, sugar-free, and uh, the once ever so popular fat-free. And these buzzwords don't necessarily mean health, although they are aligned with products that can be healthy, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are automatically in the health food category. I'm sure we've all reached for that bag of gluten-free cookies and seen that they're not always as healthy as you might think they are simply because they have that label on them. Um, when it comes to these buzzwords, you'll probably find them on a shiny package in a grocery store uh, hiding behind that label that just says vegan on it and you automatically assume because you picture a plant in your head or you picture something healthy that that popcorn or that bag is now 
healthy simply by association. So it's not necessarily a lie. It's just, it's a word game that the marketing industry is playing with us right now. Awesome. Yeah, I quite often see fat-free uh, with things like gummy bears and think, well, that does that make it healthy or not? Exactly, right? They're playing to their advantage, right? They know that they have a package of gummy bears and they know that it contains a whole bunch of sugar. So the easiest thing for them to say is, but it has no fat in it. And we kind of know this now, but the, the whole fat-free phase has started to die out. But there are still a lot of people out there who believe that something that has the labeling fat-free or low fat on it is, is healthy simply because there's less fat. But we know now that the sugar industry paid for that a long time ago to cherry pick that data and tell us, you know, no fat and fat, fat is going to make us fat. And we now know that that's not the case. And the same thing goes now for, you know, the marketing industry out there for vegan or gluten-free. As soon as you slap that on a package, someone is most likely to grab it off the shelf without even thinking to turn over the package on the back and kind of look into what's actually going on in that food. Yeah, that's true. Same with, I guess, uh, what one that's not on here is low carb. Mm -hmm. And that's the other one that's out there right now is the low carb. And if you're just grabbing that off the shelf without really being mindful of the packaging, then that's that's a downfall that the marketing industry is really hoping to to get from you, right? Because you automatically associate that buzzword with health. Yeah, exactly. So when it comes into to food labeling, I think that's the next big thing that's important to talk about. Yeah, that's when, supp supposed to be government regulated, uh, a lot of the food labeling now, right? Yes, so yes and no on that. Uh, when it comes to food labeling, there are certain things that the government has to make sure is on a label. Uh, in Canada, we have to state that there is a, where the food is coming from. So the product origin, we have to prove that on a package to ensure that we know where it's coming from, where it's been produced, where it was grown and where it was packaged. That has to be on the label. Um, the other thing that the government of Canada is trying very hard to do is to kind of help the consumer understand where there might be misrepresentation um, of claims. And so that happens a lot in um, packages that say, you know, tart cherry juice is going to help lower something in your body or a, a supplement that's going to state a claim that might not necessarily be true. They try very hard to ensure that that's not happening on a regular basis, but that still comes through from time to time. And that's where those buzzwords come back in when you see things like 100% natural, because there's no way for them to stake that claim and say that it's not natural. It's, it's just a buzzword and we're throwing that in there. So they might just put that on a label just to have that nice shiny circular green stamp that says, hey, we have something here that you need to buy. The same thing goes for vegan or fresh or any of those words that are not legally claimable are very easy to just slap on a package and have the general consumer who's walking through the grocery store just grab that and put that in their bag without really thinking about it. They just said, natural, easy, put in my cart. Mm -hmm, for sure. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to other things that have to be uh, put on the label, there is a little bit of wiggle room here that we're starting to learn with uh, food fraud. And some of the biggest food frauds out there are things like replacing um, things like olive oil with a lesser quality oil or blending uh, different oils together or ones that happen quite often are farmed fish for regular fish. And this happens a lot in, in stores uh, or in restaurants. But um, there, there's kind of this, this gray area that the government is trying to figure out how to, how to tackle that right now. And what about you? Quite often we'll see um, now you see the gluten-free, everything's gluten-free. How do you know which ones are actually, um, as far as the label goes, which ones are actually gluten-free and which ones are not? Mm -hmm. And so if a company has actually gone out of the way to pay for a certification for gluten-free, this is a pretty big deal and they're going to be pretty true to their word. Uh, there's a big difference between a certification and advertising. So when it comes to a certification like gluten-free or non-GMO or organic, these are paid certifications. And these are ones that the company has to go through a very extreme process of applying, having someone come to their location to assess their factory to assess their ingredients. And a lot of this actually has to happen on a regular basis. So some of the main ones that are out there for gluten-free in particular, um, they are 
certification programs, there's about three or four in the States and in Canada. And there are companies out there that have to come uh, on a yearly basis to check the products, to check the assembly line, to check the whole process from start to finish. And um, they test all the way until 20 parts per uh, million. And some companies actually test all the way to five parts per million. So this is quite an extreme certification that people are paying the money for. So you can, you can trust that label for sure. The newer one that's also come onto the market is the non-GMO label. There were certain companies that were just able to, you know, slap that claim on their bottle saying, hey, we have a natural product, it's non-GMO, but that is now a certified label as well that you have to pay and apply for. Um, interestingly enough, though, if you want to go into, into food labeling in that sense, there are certain companies out there that are, if we're looking at organic or natural farming, can't afford that labeling. So mm -hmm. if you're at your local farmer's market, even per se, you might find certain stands or certain companies that are touting no spray, no chemicals, no pesticides, but they can't actually legally say organic because they haven't paid for that certification. Either they can't afford it or they don't want to. And that happens too. And I've heard that um, if you're looking at the labels, as far as UPCs and stuff go, there are some that you can tell by the UPC code whether or not it's actually organic. Is that true? Yes, that's actually very doable. And this is where I really challenge people to start to look at labels and really have a good look at what's going into your cart. And you can do that all the way down to, to fruits and vegetables on your list with those UPC codes. So for the UPC codes um, for organic, it's actually going to start with a nine. So organic products will start with a nine at the beginning and it should be about five digits. And that's an easy way for you to get started there. Most conventional produce will have four digits and it usually starts with a four. So if you ever grab like a gala apple, chances are, I'm not a grocery clerk, but I think it's like 4081 or something like that. You'll see that four first if it's just a conventionally grown apple. And then the other one uh, that is actually a little bit newer that's come out is the, um, the GMO um, products that are out there. They typically actually start with an eight. So if you wanted to look at products that might be a GMO based product, it would start with an eight typically. And that would go with this certification that you're talking about as opposed to just advertising. So this one's actually the opposite. This is a non, not a non GMO food. Uh, like you'll see, you know, popcorn or chips or pasta or anything that's in a package that has that little non GMO certification on it. This is the opposite. These are genetically modified foods. Oh, got uh, you. Yes, and so um, when we're looking at produce that's been genetically modified, most mm -hmm. of them will have a five-digit code, and it should start with an eight. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's something good. for you to start to look at, right? Mm -hmm. And I that's hope that good. you guys all, you know, start to look at what's on the back of your package or what's going into your cart instead of just saying, well, this is natural on it. It's going in the cart today. Mm -hmm. So to get you started there, I think it's really important that we talk a little bit about reading those nutrition labels and really getting getting to the bottom of it instead of just relying on, on the marketing that's out there that's so easy to rely on and you see that shiny package that has all those little buzzwords on it to get you going, go past that and really start to look at your labels. Do you ever read your labels? I read my labels all the time. Okay. Um, I have for years, for sure. And where do you start when you look at a label? Um, I usually start at the, well, with the ingredients. I'll look Perfect. at the ingredients first um, and then check everything else. That's amazing. Most people, when you're looking online at how to read an ingredient list and or how to read a label, and a lot of people don't know where to start, they will say start with the serving size. And that's not necessarily where you should be starting. You really should just before you get into serving sizes, macronutrients, any of that is exactly what you're doing. Reading the ingredient list first. If you're finding that there's way too many ingredients you can't pronounce or just too many ingredients in the first place, you can put that right back on the shelf without even bothering with the calories or with the serving sizes. That's not important. I have somebody that's just asking me, what about items in bulk? Mm. So when it comes to items in bulk, uh, when we're looking at nutrition labels, if you're in a bulk store, you can actually ask for the nutrition information and they should have that available in the back because if you think about it, all of those um, items that are coming in are actually being shipped in a larger 
box and that box will have the nutrition information because that's a legal requirement. So they will have that on file somewhere for you if you are uh, interested in knowing what's in it. But please be mindful that there is always cross-contamination with bulk items. And if that's not something you're concerned with, like if you're not celiac or if you're not sensitive to certain foods, then by all means, uh, bulk can be a very easy way to get certain items for cheaper. Be mindful that if you're getting you know, things like nuts and things, they can go rancid quite quickly. So uh, being mindful of just what type of items you're getting in bulk. But if you're looking for the ingredient list or the label, you can always ask the, the grocery clerk. They, they should have that information on hand. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, it was a really good question. So when it comes to the way to read a nutrition label, and I suggest teaching this to your clients, teaching this to your friends and family, uh, it'll save you the headache later of, you know, when someone starts to ask you about health foods and, you know, I, I tried this new vegan thing or I tried this new gluten-free thing, just strip away all the buzzwords first and get down to what's actually on that label because then you can bypass all of the lies and all of the buzzwords that are out there simply by going with this first. So we're starting off with that ingredient list and then going for serving sizes. And I think this one is pretty apparent for most people, but there are a lot of people out there who will, you know, skip the serving size and just say, oh, this, this has 45 calories in it, but not being mindful of the fact that, you know, that pint of ice cream is actually, you know, being divided into eight serving sizes to make it 45 calories. So really being mindful of how that label is, is being produced to dupe you. <laughs> Yeah, I see that on cereals all the time. Yeah, nobody eats a quarter cup of ice cream or a quarter cup of cereal. It just doesn't happen that way. <laughs> yeah, you tell yourself, but it's never going to happen like that. And then from the, the calories, because we're not, at the end of the day, your body doesn't read the calorie. Your body is reading the macronutrients and the micronutrients. And this is also very important to hit home. Um, we start to look from not just the calorie portion, but looking to see, is this 100% carbs? Is this a whole bunch of, unhealthy fats or good fats? Is this pure protein? Is this a mixture of strange proteins that I don't know where they come from? Starting to look at that as well. And then also looking at the dietary fiber and other nutrition content. Um, do you know anything about how much fiber you should be getting in a day? Actually, that's one thing that I don't know a lot about. Okay. So when it comes to your um, calories for the day and your macronutrients and your micronutrients, that's all set out. There, There are advisable numbers that we should be getting in a day, but there's actually no requirement set out by the government for dietary fiber in a day because it's deemed to be a quote unquote non-essential nutrient, but fiber is so integral to how your body, uh, how your body cleans itself, how regular you are, uh, how your insulin stays stable as you eat certain foods. Um, and it's very important to note. So looking at the fiber content of a food is a good place to start. In a daily, on a daily basis, you should be getting between 25 and 35 grams of fiber daily. And that's easy to do through like real whole foods, adding in chia and fiber, I'm sorry, flax, and just finding vegetables in your, on your plate on a regular basis. But it's a really nice thing to check on a label, especially if you're getting a food that is higher in carbohydrates, seeing the fact that you have um, a carb total of say 21 grams, and seeing that there's zero dietary fiber in there, you now know that that carb source is 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 a, a nutrient dense carb or a very it has less um, less fiber, less nutrients in it, and it's going to spike your blood sugar a lot quicker. So with those packaged foods, even if you go back to those buzzwords and you see something that says gluten free or vegan or whatever it is that that healthy buzzword is telling you, flip over that package and see is it just actually a refined source of carbohydrates that's going to spike your blood sugar super quick because there's no fiber bound to it. Awesome. That's mm -hmm. great information. Thanks. And what about the macronutrients? Like when you're like a breakdown, what would you say is sort of a healthy um, uh, on a balance, a balance? Yeah. Well, or even in, in food in general, just, just curious, like for oh, macronutrients. Yeah. In for food in general, um, yeah, for your protein, just, carbs and fat, like what would you say would be a, a healthy balance? So we're definitely going to get to that when we go into the Canada food guide part. But uh, just to briefly touch on that, it's going to be different for every single person out there. It depends on what your goals are. It depends on um, your dietary 
requirements. It depends on certain genetic factors too, but we will definitely get to that in further detail when we go into the Canadian Food Guide, especially because now that it's laid out as a plate, I'm very excited to share more about that. And I also have uh, somebody that asking another question, is it possible to have too much in terms of fiber intake? Oh yes, definitely. Um, so there is so there is such thing as too little fiber for sure, and a lot of people will experience this. in In my practice, we talk a lot about bowel movements, and I won't get into that too much today. Uh, but there is a sign when you're when you're not moving things along too quickly, shall we say? That can be a sign of either way too much fiber or not enough fiber with you know a lack of water. And for the most part, it's going to be that not enough fiber and lack of water but you can have too much fiber as well. And that's going to keep things um, stuck, shall we say. So if you don't have enough fiber, or so if you have too much fiber going on and maybe even a lack of water as well, that can uh, slow things down too much. So um, definitely so, you can get too much fiber. So with that amount of fiber, what would your recommended amount of water be? So for the average person, most people, and who are just living their daily lives and aren't quite aware of how much water they should be drinking. Um, I, I've seen clients who drink one to two cups of water a day <laughs> and mm -hmm. think that that's normal. And so for the average person, if you are drinking between 25 and 35 grams of, or eating 25 and 35 grams of fiber a day, you should just in general be drinking two to three liters of water daily. And most people are not getting that. If you are working with clients as I'm sure most of you listening are, um, asking them how much water they drink and they say, oh, two cups, you need to ask them to show you what their bottle size is and how much they're drinking on a daily basis and ask them to, to tell you that for multiple days in a row because most people are not drinking enough water. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. They're drinking coffee and think that's the same thing as drinking water. Exactly, yeah. Coffee or caffeinated tea or even certain herbal teas that actually can be quite drying. So that's all important to know. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, and then those buzzwords again, just being mindful of like flipping over the package, ignoring the shiny label out there. There's so much beautiful packaging out there these days and just flipping it over and getting to the nitty gritty of what's on that package or what's in the package. Uh, just for fun, I, I like doing this with Pop-Tarts just because it's such an easy example. And obviously it would be a little bit... Uh, harder if we're going for you know say like whole foods granola or something like that but just to make it super simple and really easy to dissect let's start here with you know number one you can see like tell me what you see there enriched uh, enriched wheat flour mm -hmm. yeah so right off the bat yeah, got... enriched sounds like it's good <laughs> yeah right and so that's another uh, way that they're able to say that enriched wheat flour is wheat flour that's been bleached and then they add back in all the nutrients. So that wheat flour was broken down, processed, and then because it's completely void of anything nutritionally, they add back in uh, niacin, iron, B1, B2, and to make sure that there's actually nutrients in there. <laughs> That's the first I've ever seen reduced iron. What is reduced iron? So reduced iron is just, it's, um, it's not a full-fledged iron. It's not, I don't know why, they put that on packaging but basically it's not the full form of like supplemental iron so they're making it sound like there's iron yeah in there and there's yeah not. yeah and it's just a, a it's not a therapeutic dose of iron but it's enough to say that, that it's enriched with with nutrients again oh, uh, and then you're seeing things like soybean and palm oil and sugar and corn syrup and dextrose and high fructose corn syrup so you can count that as one two three four different kinds of sugar that they've gotten away with saying on a package right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and looking at all of that, there's way too many ingredients. There's there's so many questionable things in there. You're going to see that soybean and palm oil that we're going to talk about as well. Uh, and just being mindful of the fact that, one, that's just too many ingredients off the bat. And if oh. you were doing this with like a healthy food, you might see it. It's a simpler list of ingredients, but you still might see something like cane sugar and then honey and then another form of sugar. So they're able to to kind of sneak that in packaging quite easily by just putting sugar in different forms to you know mask the fact that there's actually so much sugar in this food. Well, for sure and it's got less than one gram of dietary fiber. Yeah there we go and I'm glad you saw that. Um, so if we go back up to the top of this you'll see the serving size servings per container this is only for one serving very easy to dissect that the fact that no one's going to eat just one pop-tart. <laughs> 
Uh, and then going back through the nutritional information, you're going to see um, that you have your total fat, you have your carbohydrates, there's 34 grams of uh, carbs and only one gram of fiber, 12 grams of sugar. So that's just 100% sugar. So if we're thinking about our macronutrients in general, all carbohydrates break down into glucose, right? That is the final end product of a carbohydrate. No matter if it comes from pasta, if it comes from a yam, if it comes from honey, the final end product of a carbohydrate is glucose. And so it basically, you're just determining how fast it's gonna to take to get there. And in this food, it's going to happen very quickly. It's gonna spike your blood sugar very, very quickly because there's nothing for it to bind to. There's not a lot of fat or protein or fiber to slow that process down in the body. Mm -hmm. The other thing I find super interesting about this label is that on number five there, do you see how it says total carbohydrates and then dietary fiber? Mm -hmm. So this is just showing you, um, actually, it's a trick. Uh, calories per gram, fat, carbs, and protein are actually just how many calories are in one gram of fat or one gram of carb or one gram of protein, just in general for all of these foods. This is a ruse. And same thing for the dietary fiber. It's showing you how much you should be getting in a day. And it has nothing to do with the actual food source because you can see up here, back in that number four box, that in this food, there's actually one gram of dietary fiber. And it was a good old trick that they were able to put on here. Wow. Right. And then if you look at the bonus here, which is always fun, this is a, supposedly a great source of calcium. There's zero trans fat in it, and it's been enriched with four B vitamins. But technically, that's it's not even worth mentioning, but they're able to put that on the package. Hmm. Yeah. And obviously, this is a very extreme example, but it's very easy to take this and then apply it to healthy foods that you find in your grocery store or basically anything in between just having that flip over and ignoring those little bonus signs that they're telling you like the zero trans fat the vitamins and actually going to the nitty-gritty of what's in your food yeah for sure so going forward into some of the other lies that we've been told by the by the food industry is i really want to touch on on healthy sugars and what actually what actually what that means and what sugar is in, in general. When it comes down to it, sugar in all forms is a simple carbohydrate, as I mentioned. So carbohydrates all break down into glucose. Sugars uh, can come in many different forms, but they are technically a simple carbohydrate. So they are, um, there's not a lot of chains in between them. They get broken down quite easily into that final form of glucose. But there, something worth mentioning is that not all sugar is created equal right so you have sugar found in beets you have sugar found in carrots you have sugar found in grains and then you have processed sugars and i think we all know well enough by now that you know the sugar that you find in a carrot is very different than the sugar you find in roger's table sugar but mm -hmm. uh, we also have to find the middle ground of those natural sugars that are permeating the health food industry right now and being mindful of um, what's going on there so when it comes to natural sugar, even cane sugar, even honey, even things like that, that will spike your blood sugar because it's not bound to, to anything else, right? Even if you're eating honey on its own, while raw honey is a lovely um, form of, of nutrients, it's still going to spike your blood sugar. Um, but compared to a processed sugar that's also potentially bound to, say, um, like a, a refined carbohydrate source, you're still better off choosing a little bit of honey and say like a nice piece of apple compared to a piece of cane sugar that is, you know, mixed with some white flour. For sure. What about like you hear them talking about organic sugar? Yeah. And so when we're talking about organic sugar, what we can think about there is the fact that the organic is, while it's not necessarily a buzzword in this sense, it's the idea that that source is coming from a, a place where it's not sprayed, there's no chemicals, and we now know that, that that sugar is not going to have any of those toxic chemicals attached to it when we eat it. But uh, that being said, we can be thankful of the fact that one, we're not eating it, two, the farmers that are farming it are not being exposed to those chemicals, but we still have to remember that that sugar is sugar. And regardless of the fact that it's, um, it's organic, 
it's still going to break down just as simply as the non-organic cane sugar. If you put the two tablespoons side by side, one just simply has less chemicals on it. The other one has no chemicals and is organic, but if you put them both on your tongue, they're going to digest the same. No, oh, for sure. Now, when it comes to just sugars in general, they are going to affect your gut health. Gut health is a very, very um, prominent topic right now in, in our industry, talking about how your mood is affected by gut health, your sleep is affected by gut health, your happiness, everything in between. Um, if you're not aware, uh, your gut and your brain are connected by a nerve. It's called the vagus nerve. And there's a reason why we have this, this notion of like the gut brain connection or that gut feeling. Your gut bacteria are responsible for making 90% of your serotonin, your feel good hormones, or some of yeah. your feel good hormones. And they send that from your gut to your brain. So if you think about how sugar is starting to work on the good gut bacteria compared to some of those bad gut bacteria that we have, we all have a balance of good and bad. And that's, that's how our gut is supposed to, to be on a regular basis. But if we feed our guts too much of the sugar on a regular basis and not feed enough of the, the balanced macronutrients that we need, we can start to experience a little bit of dysbiosis and kind of have the bad gut bacteria, shall we say, take over from the good guys. And that can lead, lead to an imbalance and also to more sugar cravings. Um, and just to kind of quickly note on some of where you might find those healthy sugars or unhealthy sugars, they hide in super unsuspecting places, which is why label reading is so important. Being mindful of, you know, even organic salsa or organic pasta sauce. I find this all the time at Whole Foods. You find like a beautiful package of pasta sauce and you flip it over. It's organic. It's $10 for some crazy small size of pasta sauce and there's sugar in it, even though it's organic cane sugar. So just being mindful of where that sugar might hide and not being deterred or um, I guess not being taken for a ride by the fact that it simply says organic cane sugar on it. Um, when it goes to yeah, sugar in general, too much sugar is too much sugar. And some of the ones that we need to discuss can be found on this list. If you just take a quick second to have a look through this and see how sugar can hide in different labels, it might surprise you. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of these before, um, you know, fruit juice concentrate, glucose, golden syrup, high fructose corn syrup, all that stuff we know are, are the ones that we want to avoid. But there are some out there that we are still using on a regular basis. And we think that they're, you know, the healthier option out there, but they're, they're not quite as cut and dry as we think they are. Where would uh, stevia fit into this list? Mm -hmm. So stevia is actually not technically uh, a sugar. Mm -hmm. uh, it's derived from a plant. And um, stevia is part of the chrysanthemum family. And basically the leaf itself is very sweet. And so when they first discovered it, it was in its full leaf form, right? So the same thing as you'd find, say like a peppermint leaf or any other leaf out there. It has, it has a very specific flavor. They found that it was very sweet and then they decided to refine it. And mm -hmm. so when we're talking about stevia, um, the refining process makes it kind of null and void. So to find the, the stevia you find on the shelf, while it doesn't spike blood sugar the same way that any of these sugars on your screen right now do, um, which is why it's toted to be such a healthy sweetener because there's no calories, doesn't spike your blood sugar, it's supposedly non-addictive, but that's the plant itself. And remember, everything is marketable. So they've taken a raw product, which is that leaf that's sweet, and they've refined it. And so to take a green leaf and turn it into very white powder, how do you think it gets there? Well, adding stuff into exactly. it would be one thing. Yeah, so through chemical processing, extraction, adding things in. A lot of the stevias that you find that are powdered are actually not 100% stevia. They'll be mixed with things like xylitol or erythritol and all these other types of sugar alcohols to make that blend that you see on your shelf. There's actually a couple that are out there. It's Truvia and uh, Pure, Purevia. Uh, those two ends are actually, they were invented by Coke and Pepsi. Oh, yeah. And they've been patented. So they came up with their own blend of stevia so they were able to extract it and then add it in with i do believe it's erythritol to make 
their own brand of stevia. So it's once again, just an industry thing that they've been able to take something that was, you know, in a pure form, just sweet and make it something else. If you're looking for stevia, um, there are other options out there. I, I much prefer the liquid form if you are going to use stevia because the liquid form, if you find it uh, as an extract, a pure extract, will be extracted the same way that vanilla is ex extracted. So with a with an alcohol. And so you don't need a much of it, just a drop, uh, a drop or two, and it will be quite sweet uh, and it won't have any of that um, chemical process going on. So I have somebody asking me, what about monk fruit? Is that the same as stevia? Oh, perfect. I was so happy that someone brought up monk fruit. So monk fruit is not the same as stevia. Monk fruit actually comes from a fruit source. Uh, it's grown in Asia, um, different parts of Asia. I do believe in Thailand and China. And it is uh, a better option than stevia for the fact that they're not processing it the same. But you also have to be mindful that you're finding a, a source of real monk fruit extract. So some of them are now being blended with erythritol and other things. Being mindful that um, just flip it over and make sure that it is 100% monk fruit extract. And you'll notice the difference in price. Monk fruit in, in terms of the pricing is much more expensive than some of the other sweeteners out there. And for good reason, it's because they're, they're doing it better for now, for now, but making sure that you're doing your research on your brand for monk fruit. And since it's, it comes from a fruit, then would it still spike your blood sugar at no. all? No. So it was actually, um, yeah, it's it's not quite the same. It was um, originally used in traditional herbal medicine in, in those countries um, mm -hmm. to help with, you know, flavor and other things. And then they were able to, to make a sweetener out of it as well. But it, just being mindful, once again, like if you're looking at the package and the color is not that kind of golden brown that you're seeing in some of the brands out there right now, and it's bleach white and it, it might not be true monk fruit extract. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Going back through just that list there, some of the ones I really want to touch on uh, that are still permeating the industry are agave nectar and brown rice syrup. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever worked with agave nectar before? I've, I've had it. Yeah. Okay. Um, very thick and yeah, I, thick, I, I don't, I don't like the texture. Yeah. It's thick and, and yeah. yeah. And so for that process, actually, they actually have to refine it. And so while it's always marketed as like a very natural product, um, to get it to that state of being like that syrup, that nectar that they, they talk about and, and, uh, and advertise is actually super highly processed and it's, uh, up to about 80% fructose. And so fructose is a type of sugar that we have to process through our liver. It can be a little bit more of a burden on our body than other types of sugar, but basically it's a refined source of fructose that we don't want to be eating on a regular basis. And you'll find this in a lot of those buzzword foods, um, like a lot of the plant-based ice creams, or if you're looking at different types of bars that have that agave nectar in it, uh, that's something you do want to steer clear of. Mm. And same thing goes for brown rice syrup. To get that out of um, brown rice requ requires a lot of packaging, sorry, a lot of processing, a lot of chemicals and, and a heat process that we don't want to expose sugar to. So just one more quick question before we uh, mm -hmm. go on to these the sugar-free sweeteners. Um, with uh, Stevia, would, you, would somebody like to know if there's a particular brand that you would say is better? Mm, um, I don't have a brand off the top of my head for Stevia. Um, please be mindful that you're looking at the backs of the packages and making sure that it's not just 99% erythritol and then 1% Stevia. If you want to make your own, actually, it's, it's quite easy. If you go to a local, if you're in the Vancouver area, there's tons of local herb shops or you can order it online through a lot of um, companies, either through the States or through Canada, where you can order Stevia actually as a plant. And then you can make your own extract out of it with either um, like a grain free alcohol and make your own what we call a tincture in herbal medicine. And you can actually make your own stevia. Yeah. Yeah. It's not expensive. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So going back through some of the next ones, which are the sugar free sweeteners, people are starting to steer a little bit clearer of these guys. But it's still worth mentioning that we do want to be avoiding these in products. You find them a lot in, in you know, gum and um, low-calorie beverages. 
but they still find a place on in some of the packaged food that we eat. And aspartame and sucralose are, are not natural sugars, and they actually affect our gut health quite intensely. So there's a lot of new studies coming out now where they're taking aspartame and um, having, you know, through animal studies and some human studies now, um, they're finding that by eating aspartame and sucralose, it actually kills off a lot of the good gut bacteria that you have. It just induces this die off of your healthy gut bacteria because they somehow do not interact well with these unnatural sugars. When they first came out with aspartame and sucralose, they were supposedly these alternatives that were deemed to be healthy because they passed through the system without changing. But now what we're finding is that they're changing our gut health by killing off some of those good bugs that we have going on in there. So please feel free to steer clear of the sugar-free sweeteners and finding um, different types of bars, especially like you're looking at protein bars, they typically hide in there. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then just some of the other healthy sugars that are out there right now, things like xylitol, sorbitol, mannitol, and erythritol are also uh, on the market right now as you know healthier options for sugar. And these are sugar alcohols, so they're not uh, they're not made from the same um, chemical compound as as regular sugar, and they break down a little bit differently in the body. Um, they are typically quite low calorie and they taste a little bit different than regular sugar. They come from different sources. So things like xylitol and erythritol are actually a byproduct of wood processing, um, which in itself can be an issue, uh, if depending on where you're getting the source from. But it's also the fact that they can cause a lot of um, just GI upset. So for a lot of people, this can cause um, just diarrhea or a gastric upset because of the fact that they don't actually um, they don't absorb well in the small intestine. And so basically when they get to your small intestine, they don't break down the same way sugar does and your body doesn't quite know what to do with it. So it can cause bloating, it can cause uh, different types of stomach upset and we don't want to expose ourselves to too much of these sugar alcohols. And they do hide in a lot of those, you know, healthier um, buzzword worthy foods that are out there these days. Yeah, no kidding. Mm -hmm. When it comes to sugar in general, um, the first step obviously is to be mindful of where you're getting your sugar from and, and starting to cut down uh, on sugar and then being mindful of the fact that sugar is addictive. It lights up the same components of our brain as, as cocaine does. It's, a, it's an, a, a hit of dopamine for the body and being mindful of where you're getting that sugar from, starting to cut it out and you know relying on real food sources of sugar instead and and also on the flip side not beating yourself up over having sugar from now and then um is a is a healthy way to be uh somebody's just ask, asking if maple syrup is okay mm. so when it comes to sugars we do want to find more natural sugars right so maple syrup honey uh even things like coconut sugar are your better option than some of these um you know, fake sugars out there that we don't want to be eating on a regular basis. Now, that being said, um, at the end of the day, if you have a little bit of agave nectar here and there, it's not going to to kill you, but we still want to be mindful of, of where we're getting the sugar from. So I would definitely suggest, you know, maple syrup and honey and some of those natural sugars over these quote unquote healthy sugars here, but also again in moderation. If you're baking yourself a paleo cake, shall we say, and it calls for a cup of maple syrup, there's also an issue there, right? Because at the end of the day, that sugar is still sugar, but it's a better option, 100% maple syrup, yeah. Awesome. Another thing that's still floating around in, in the realm of, of nutrition is vegetable oil. And the fact that it's been deemed to be heart healthy, it's been deemed to lower cholesterol, uh, it's been deemed as a very easy oil to cook with because it's stable. and this is something that we need to, to debunk right here and right now. Um, basically, vegetable oil, if, if you guys can picture a piece of corn in your head or canola, uh, it would take a lot to, to make oil out of that, if you think about it. And so to make vegetable oil, we are purifying the oil, quote unquote, to deodorize it, filter it, and neutralize the oil uh, through processes with heat, acids, leach, chemicals, um, and even things like hexane, so 
chemicals that we don't want to be eating on a regular basis, but we have I was to expose. Say that doesn't sound edible. <laughs> it's not, and but we have to expose these plants to it to actually extract the oils out. And um, by doing this, we are now refining that oil. So there is such thing as you know cold pressed canola oil, but what I'm talking about here is refined oil that is now stable. And what I mean by stable is it becomes um, the actual chemical compound changes. So these vegetable oils are, um, they're polyunsaturated fats. So what that means is that they are a, an unsaturated bond. So if you think back to high school chemistry, their, their bonds are not, um, they're not stable, right? So we have uh, little things that are missing here and there. And what happens is that when they're exposed to heat, they don't like it and they need to change and flip to become stable right because when we expose the things to heat everything starts to vibrate and we make that switch and they're now a stable fat so these um once upon a time deemed to be healthy oils are now rancid because we've flipped around their chemical compound to make them heat stable so all of the healthy things that people are talking about are now null and void hmm now they do have a higher smoke point, which is what a lot of people talk about, right? So if you're deep frying and someone's going to throw that, you know, French fry in canola oil, that uh, oil is quote unquote heat stable, but the actual oil itself is is not a healthy compound because of the fact that its natural polyunsaturated form has shifted. And if you think about your body, um, it likes to read it basically has a whole bunch of doors in it if you put it this way right and all of the foods that you eat are keys and your body doesn't understand this key anymore this key is now broken and when you put that key in your body and it can't unlock a door it needs to go somewhere and it needs to do something and that's what causes inflammation and those trans fats that we sometimes seem to well, they we are trans fats but basically um, these natural nor not naturally formed trans fats are basically the analogy I can give you is that broken key and it's trying to find something, you know, to open in the body, but the body can't read it. And so it doesn't know what to do with it. So when it comes to that idea of that broken key, um, basically this can lead to inflammation and not just because of the fact that they are uh, damaged fats. It's also the fact that they are very high in a polyunsaturated fat called um, omega, omega-6. And I'm sure you've heard of omega-3s, yes? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, and have you heard of omega-6? Yeah, and omega-9. And, and okay, seven, perfect. Too, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And so in this case, we're going to talk a little bit just about omega-6. And omega-6, we do need omega-6 in the diet. And these plant oils have high amounts of omega-6 in them. But remember, um, basically, these omega these omegas are very cool because what you do is when you eat them, they actually change shape uh, once you digest them, and they start to move into these intermediate forms that are very useful. Um, but the problem is that we need them in a certain balance. And in our diet on a day to day basis now, we're getting way too much of the omega six, not enough of the omega three, uh, and they're not balancing each other out the right way anymore. So omega six, the final compound of an omega six is um, is very inflammatory it's arachidonic acid and it's uh it's just an, a pro-inflammatory compound all of the intermediates of omega-6 wonderful but that last component is quite um quite inflammatory it can can cause inflammation in the body through processes that we won't get into here now omega-3s on the other hand wonderful um intermediates as well but its final end product is a is an anti-inflammatory compound and in our you know, Western way of living, we're eating a lot more of these damaged omega-6s, not a lot of these omega-3s coming from flax and coming from, um, you know, salmon and things like that. We're getting a lot more of these canola oils and these peanut oils and all of these damaged oils that you're finding on a regular basis in just about everything. And so this is leading to not just, you know, gut issues, this is leading to chronic inflammation. And this is a component of why people in the Western world who are eating these foods on a regular basis are feeling feeling not the way they should be on a regular basis. So if you're looking at your packages, and like I will keep coming back to the fact that label reading and avoiding those buzzwords is so important, you're looking for things like canola oil and safflower and sunflower and grapeseed oil and soybean oil and even sesame oil as well because sesame is just a delicate fat um, that it can go rancid quite quickly. But 
think about all the packaged food you eat and what you're looking at on these on on the backs of you know peanuts or the backs of even pasta sauce all that kind of stuff this is not raw cold pressed canola oil this is very highly processed omega-6 so what would you say is a good oil for us to use then if for um yes so when it, for cooking in general this is a question i get a lot is what kind of what kind of oil should I be cooking with on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. uh, and we're looking for a real saturated fat. And so a saturated fat, if you go back to that idea of that, that you know, high school uh, chemistry class, a saturated fat is a bond that is saturated. And what that means is that it's stable. So as it gets exposed to heat, it's not going to flip on us. It's a, a trusty bond that's not going to break. And so you'll see on this list here, uh, that red, is going to be the, the saturated fat. And you can see this coconut oil, forget about the margarine, we're gonna ignore the margarine here. Um, you're gonna see uh, grass-fed ghee, we're gonna talk about grass-fed butter, um, and those are your best options to be, to be cooking with because they are stable bonds, right? So they're not going to flip on you as you start to cook at higher temperatures. Whereas you can see things like um, safflower and canola oil on this list in the middle, you can see that there's not a lot of the saturated bonds and much more of these monounsaturated and polyunsaturated bonds that once they get exposed to heat are going to flip on you. Yeah. And when you say flip on, what do you, uh, on you, what do you mean by flip on? What you? I mean by that is by the idea, if you're picturing that, that high school chemistry bond in your mind, they're mm -hmm. going to be, because they're unsaturated bonds, when the going gets tough and it gets quite hot, they need to find something to bind to and to bond. And so they're going to flip and and kind of move around a little bit until they find a way to become saturated or they're going to to move in a way um, that basically changes their their chemical composition. And that's when our body, you know, doesn't read that broken key anymore. Does that make sense? For sure. I just have somebody asking, and what about macadamia oil? Mm. So macadamia oil, um, I've never really cooked with it because it's very expensive. Um, mm -hmm. It's a beautiful oil though. Um, when it comes to cooking, it does hold up to a higher smoke point. Um, if you can get your hands on it, it would be something lovely to work with. It has a very strong flavor from what I know, um, but definitely worth looking into if you, if you are looking for a higher quality uh, saturated fat. Hmm. That was a great question. Yeah. Um, just a quick note here on, on some of um, the ideas about butter, and I'd love mm -hmm. to put that in there, is that not all butter is created equal, just like not all food is created equal. Looking for um, butter that's grass-fed is always integral here, and it's not because that changes the way of the bonds, it's just because you are what your food eats. eats. So when you're getting a grass-fed piece of butter, you're getting um, a product that is coming from an animal that you know its digestive system is meant to eat grass and because it's eating grass its gut is creating more vitamin k2 which you're getting in the butter and you're also getting just a higher quality end product because that cow is not being fed gmo grains it's not being exposed to different types of um, chemicals that it might be getting you know in a in a place where it's being exposed to to grains where you don't know the source yeah i generally always uh, stick with butter Myself. Yes. And then quickly going on to just like the milk alternatives too, uh, something I want to touch on. We live in a day and age where we have so many options on the shelf um, of plant-based milk. If you are avoiding dairy, if you're trying to, you know, uh, cut back on that and, and start to drink more almond milk or rice milk or oat milk and all that kind of good stuff out there, being mindful of what's in those packages too. So once again, it does come back down to labeling and really looking at what's what's in that package and almond milk is very easy to make at home it takes a couple of tries the first time and then once you get the hang of it it's so easy to make at home but if you're looking at a packaged one you're looking to see where the base comes from right so there were um there was a company out there whose whose label is actually on the shelf right now um there was a lawsuit put against them because their almond milk was found to only be two percent almonds and then the rest was water and filler wow Yes, and so being mindful of where, what, a, what ingredients are actually in your plant-based milk and then what other ingredients are in there. The main one is sugar. Uh, there should never be sugar in your milk, in your, in your almond milk or your plant-based milk. 
uh, simply because it just doesn't need to be there. It's added there for taste to make it taste like something and to have it be satiating, but it's not necessary. And what's, what's your thoughts on uh, soy soy milk? Because it gets a pretty bad rap. Soy milk gets a pretty bad rap, and I'm I'm not 100% pro soy, but I'm not 100% against soy either. I I will take the middle ground and say if you are going to use a soy product, please make sure that it's non-GMO and it's organic. Uh, mm -hmm. is your best bet when it comes to, to soy in general um, like a, a sprouted or a, um, a fermented soy product will be a better option there's not a lot of fermented soy milk products out there that wouldn't be delicious but when it comes to soy in general um, it just helps to break down some of the anti-nutrients that soy contains and finding it uh, in more of a whole form is better so like tempeh or a natural form of tofu that's not been processed as much um, when it comes to soy milk, definitely, if you're going to be going for that option, non-GMO um, and organic for sure. Yeah. And coconut milk? Coconut milk. So coconut milk is an interesting one. Um, for I love coconut milk, and I I use it in quite a few of my of my dishes. But I also am mindful of the fact that the coconut milk that you find in the carton, like you see in this picture, is not real coconut milk. It's been watered down the same way that almond milk has been watered down. And if you're looking for the real deal, you're looking for one, once again, that's 100% coconut milk. Um, you're looking for one that doesn't have the guar gum in it or other fillers or binders. And they're out there, they're easy to find. Um, you're not looking you know, at Whole Foods, you're looking at actually um, more um, like, uh, like international markets or Asian markets, and you'll find real coconut milk that is either coming in a quality Tetra Pak or a BPA-free can uh, that's coming from Thailand or coming from a place where they're they're making real coconut milk and not just watering it down with fillers. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to ingredients for milk alternatives, I highly suggest skipping the sugar for one and then finding ones if you can without carrageenan. And carrageenan is an interesting filler it's um it comes from algae and it helps to make things thick and there's this huge debate on whether or not it's carcinogenic or not yeah i hear and, that all the time yes and so there's a debate on if this is true if this isn't true and what i can tell you is that we still don't have too too much of uh, the 100 percent facts out there but there are two different types of carrageenan. There is a, a food-based one, so a food-approved one, and then there is a non-food-approved one. Non-food-approved one we know now is it's not good for us. The food-approved one, we're still in the, in the debate because they've done testing on animals and they found certain results. They haven't done too much testing on humans, so we don't know uh, how, how that plays out. But we know that certain people with food sensitivities or gut issues have issues digesting carrageenan, and that can be like, if someone switches from say dairy milk to a plant-based milk and they're finding that they have a stomach upset, carrageenan can be an issue for certain people. Um, so being mindful of, of just the fillers that are in your almond milk, if you're still noticing you have gut issues after switching from dairy to a plant-based alternative. Um, same thing with guar gum or soy lecithin or sunflower lecithin, all of these fillers can be, um, can be an issue for for the digestive system just simply because our gut doesn't quite know what to do with them hmm. yeah carrageenan while it does come from algae it still has to go through a process to get there right and so through that process that can cause some of the questions that people have about whether or not it's healthy for us as well as the the gut issues for some people and then finally, the last bit on just milk alternatives, looking and just in all food in general, looking at preservatives. What's what's in your food? Are you finding things? Um, oh my goodness, like titanium dioxide in food. Are you finding things like lesser things that are a little bit safer, like calcium carbonate? But just being mindful of of what types of preservatives are in your your milk or in just the packaged food that you're buying on a regular basis. Is there anything in particular that we should be looking out for as far as preservatives go? Like, oh what, what, what would you say is like one of the more often right. used ones that are, we would say were more dangerous for us? To I'd use? say the, the nitrites and the nitrates, uh, sulfites for people who have um, like issues with food sensitivities or headaches. 
uh, any of the the colors as well, not even just preservatives, but um, the the dyes out there. Be mindful of food dyes. And then another big one is sodium benzoate. Um, that one you find in um, canned food or canned pop or things like club soda. And that one is something I suggest steering clear of as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it reacts, interestingly enough, with um, citrus fruit. And that in itself, citrus plus the sodium benzoate can actually cause a carcinogenic compound. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that ruins um, vodka sodas for a lot of people. <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's not something that obviously um, you have to remember everything in, in I, I won't say everything in moderation, but at the same time, I will say everything in moderation. If you're going to have, you know, agave nectar one day, don't think, oh my gosh, I've done something horrible to my body. It was one time. But just being mindful that all of the stuff that we're talking about here are things that if you're doing on a regular basis, on a daily basis, day in and day out, they're going to affect you on a on on a large scale, right? The same way that anything would. If you're going to, you know, um, walk the same path every day, you're going to make a a line on that path. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Everything and then in moderation. Of, every yes, yes. Um, and then getting to some of the buzzword foods, uh, we've kind of already covered this, but just being mindful of of looking. At what's out there and we have so many options we're so lucky now especially to live where we live to have all these amazing food options for people who have specific dietary needs or who are looking for different options out there and something new and different and exciting but being mindful to not just fall for that so we've already talked about the gluten-free packaged food but things like vegan cheese that's huge right now and i'm not talking about you know the plant-based cheese you're making out of nuts at home with nutritional yeast and garlic I'm talking about the package stuff that's out there because remember everything is marketable so uh, the vegan cheese that's out there right now on the shelf in a package that says you know cheddar style cheese is full of some very questionable ingredients like modified food starch and that comes from anything from wheat from corn from anything in between that's been bleached and processed and chemically altered to make this odd food like thing to hold it together to make quote unquote cheese mm -hmm. yeah and so just being mindful of those foods that you know because you see vegan and cheese and you know that you know nut cheese is delicious just because you think that you're going to go and find these cheddar style chunks and you know put that in your vegan grilled cheese and think that you've done something um healthy because the marketing industry has told you so yeah absolutely so. i've seen uh, titanium dioxide in some of those and that's also in um Sunscreen. Sunscreen. Yes, exactly. And so being mindful of the fact that those should not be in food and that's not, that shouldn't be in your grilled cheese sandwich. Let's just put it that way. No. Yeah. And then going into things like plant-based ice cream. Uh, I love coconut milk ice cream. It's one of my, it's one of my guilty pleasures. Um, but being mindful of, you know, making it yourself or finding a store in your city that's doing it well from scratch compared to the one at the grocery store that's, you know, full of guar gum and agave nectar and all of these different types of, of fillers um, to make it what it is. So being mindful of your ingredients once again. And same thing with low calorie ice cream. Um, there, there are some great brands out there for that, but thinking back to the ingredients, it's modified milk ingredients, it's erythritol, it's xylitol, and being mindful that for a lot of people that's going to affect your gut and how, how that feels. And then quickly going on to vegan sweets, same thing. Um, just, you know, you see vegan and you think sweets and you say, cool, I've got a healthy, you know, alternative to my gummy bears that I eat. But at the same time, remember what's in it to make it what it is. Read that label and make sure that you're not just falling for the buzzwords that are out there for everything that's Instagram worthy or, you know, that's been toted by some guru on the internet saying this is a vegan food or this is a gluten free food or this is a paleo food. And just because it has those buzzwords around it. Um, necessarily doesn't mean it doesn't necessarily mean it's healthy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <clears throat> so going back to that idea of the plate and the new Canadian food guide, I'm, I know that we're we're coming to the end here. Uh, I really wanted to just share this with you guys because this was a huge step for the Canadian food guide. Do you remember the old food guide at all? Absolutely. Yeah. With all the pretty pictures and the rainbow and yeah exactly it was a rainbow there was the cartoon bread and the cartoon cereal and the cartoon milk and it, it kind of painted this kind of fun picture of what your meal would look like um 
And if you think back to it, there were four food groups. They had fruit and vegetables as one group, meat, grains, and dairy. And that mm-hmm. was your plate. Mm-hmm. And now we've gone from that to just three. So we've gone to meat, fruit, and vegetables, and grains. And the other thing that they've taken away uh, was that there's no serving size anymore. So before it was eat X amount of portions of dairy, X amount of grains, X amount of meat, uh, so on and so forth. And they've kind of taken that out. And instead, um, they've, they've put it as this plate. And now the plate has some people up in arms saying that it looks too much like a diet. They don't quite know where to go with it. Uh, but I, I'm quite happy to say that I think this is a step in the right direction because I think looking at a plate is, is such a nice way of, of you know, seeing what should be there on a regular basis. Now, when it comes to what's here now, we're looking at... Uh, lots of vegetables, lots of grains, and a little bit of meat, and no dairy. So that was the huge first step in in dropping dairy from the whole Canadian food guide. Uh, and they've now made water the drink of choice. Uh, the other thing that we're looking at here is that we see a lot more plant-based protein options. So they're talking more about legumes and, and tofu and um, nuts and things for your for your plant, sorry for your protein option, which is great for people who are you know eating in, in that lifestyle and are looking for options and can now you know see that on their plate, which is wonderful. Do you see something that's missing though on this plate? Uh, there's no fats like yes. avocado or anything like that. Yes. So they kind of didn't touch on the fact that we need healthy fat in our diet, uh, which is sad but I think this is still a huge step in the right direction so if we were to reorganize this plate I really wish I could move it around like with a fork and actually visually show this to you but I would love to rearrange this a bit with you know having those healthy fats on your plate from you know coconut oil and avocados olive oil like real olive oil coming you know first cold press extra virgin olive oil um, you know avocados coconut oil even you know things like grass-fed butter if you are eating uh, dairy and then reorganizing the vegetable portion to find that your starchy carbs, like your potatoes, your peas, your yams, you could bunch that all up with your grains in one category and then leave the non-starchy vegetables in its own category. Does that make sense? So that way, if you're looking at the plate kind of as it is right now, mm-hmm. you're kind of just seeing three quarters of a plate of carbohydrates and a quarter plate of protein. Oh, right? for sure. So if we reorganize it and made it so there was, you know, the grains and the potatoes and the starchy the starchy veg were in one section and maybe like a little bit smaller, lots of dark leafy greens, lots of uh, non-starchy vegetables, and then you have your protein. And then somewhere in there, we drizzle a whole bunch of good quality fat on there. And I'd call that a really good plate. <laughs> but uh, in general, I think this is a huge step in the right direction. Um, we also have to, to kind of make a point here that not everyone feels like they can eat this way because some people are saying it's it's unaffordable it's not the same for everyone but the big thing that you have to remember is that this is an overview this is a guide for just the general population it's not going to be the same for everyone but it's a huge step in the right direction in my opinion yeah absolutely yeah the other thing that I think is worth mentioning as well is the fact that they actually tied in mindfulness around eating. So being mindful and present when you eat, which has never really been done before in Canadian food guides. Uh, everyone you know, sits on their phones or watches TV and is never quite present when you eat. And that changes how you digest your food. If you want to talk about you know, stress in the system, if you have a stressful day, you're not actually digesting your food the same way that you would be if you were sitting down and being calm because your body is in a state state of fight or flight. So being mindful around eating is is important. Cooking for yourself, enjoying your food, eating meals with others, using food labels. And please remember to start with your, you know, ingredient list, looking there, limiting foods that are high in sodium, sugars, and then the bad saturated fats. Not all saturated fats bad, but we'll we can talk about that for a long time. And then the food marketing, which is what we've been talking about for this whole hour, is just really being mindful that the marketing industry has a hold on us in terms of of food and how we enjoy food, how we look at food, how we think about food all day long, right? And so I like how they put that in here. So would that go back to eating whole foods as opposed to packaged foods so they can't really- 100%. (laughs) Yeah, 100%. To get to us that way, right? Yeah, 
Yeah. And when it comes to that, just, just a brief note on kind of, we've kind of broken everything down and debunked everything. And I feel like I can't just leave you saying, okay, we'll go into the world and never eat these things. Here's what you should be eating on a regular basis. And, you know, like you can definitely give this opinion to family and friends and, and share that. But the dietary needs will, will vary from person to person. And not every diet is right for every person. But in general, we're talking, we don't want to count calories. That's not the answer. Your body doesn't read a calorie. It reads the macro and micronutrients um, in food. So you're looking for the vitamin and minerals. You're looking for the protein, quality protein, quality carbohydrates, quality fats, and a focus on real whole foods in general. Uh, and then the fiber throwing in there too. And then if you don't know, so I'm starting to consult a specialist for um, like just questions and concerns that you have around food and supplements and all of that. So when you say consulting with a specialist, then you're talking like a nutritionist or... Yeah, so a nutritionist, a dietitian, or even someone like um, who, who's just well-versed in this because this is a very open-ended industry right now. Obviously, going to see a registered dietitian is a little bit different. Um, that is um, a, a very different governing body, but not necessarily... You don't necessarily need to just rely on their advice. They have their own governing body that's run by the government uh, and has to follow those Canadian food guidelines. Um, whereas if we're looking at the holistic view of, of nutrition, um, there's actually a whole world of options out there. And that actually does extend to, to people in, in the fitness field as well. So people who are in the fitness industry um, are able to give, you know, some nutritional advice, but being mindful of the fact that it's important to educate on that and know what you're talking about instead of just spouting off, you know, something you've read on the internet and gaining that advice, going to school for it, taking the courses on it to understand not just, you know, the, the components behind your macro and micronutrients and understanding, you know, what protein is or what vitamin A is, but understanding dietary needs of certain individuals, understanding how to recognize certain conditions, um, understanding, you know, what supplements are good for certain things, how to use certain supplements, all of that is something that is open to, to people in the fitness industry. But I highly suggest um, finding a course to do that through because at the end of the day, um, as a fitness professional, you can give nutritional advice, but you have to remember that the person in front of you is a, is a human being who by giving them certain advice, you can, you can affect them in, in extreme ways because food, food is medicine, herbal mm -hmm. supplements are medicine, supplements like vitamins, they're all, they're all um, very powerful. And so you have to understand what you're doing before giving out too, too much of that advice. Well, I, yeah. And as a fitness professional, we can only use the Canada food guide as a guide, unless we do have that extra um, knowledge from mm -hmm. taking courses. For sure, and, and that knowledge is, is super important. And, and to be honest, I'd love to share a little bit more about what, what I'm doing next. I'm, I'm teaching uh, a new course in September through InfoFit, um, and we will be covering a lot more of what we've talked about today, but just giving people the knowledge to for themselves and for their clients to really go forward and and you know expand other people's minds too and kind of share share this general information that while it might be you know obvious to you and me the general population doesn't know any of this yet and it's up to us to share that with them um, the course that we're we're running in September is called the Certified Sports Performance and Fitness Nutrition Specialist Course and we're going to be covering everything from the basics of macronutrients and micronutrients so understanding your protein your carbs your fats um, all of the vitamins and minerals out there and you know what they do what their purpose is in the body going through basic physiology and you know the endocrine system the reproductive system all that kind of stuff how that all ties together um, genetics common conditions that are out there coaching uh, coaching clients holistic medicine nutritional protocols and diets and supplements and how to use them herbal medicine all of that's going to be covered in that course and um, if you are looking for more information I would highly suggest looking for more information about that so one of the questions was actually about the keto diet um, mm -hmm. that somebody asked um, would that be covered within this course yes so we're going to be covering uh, all of the main diets that are out there right now we'll be talking about paleo and keto and you know high carb low fat 
or high fat, low carb, all of that stuff we will be covering in this course. Um, intermittent and fasting. Intermittent fasting, all of it. Yeah, we will be touching on that uh, in detail. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so what is your, just curious, what is your thought on the keto diet since uh, <laughs> That, which is what the quest the question was. Okay, yeah. So the keto diet is an interesting one. Um, we don't have enough research about the long term effects of someone being in keto. We we don't have enough of a um, like a huge uh, collection of individuals yet um, about to to glean that information of long term use of keto, except for those who have um, specific medical conditions. So if you are suffering from major seizures we've now discovered that if you don't respond to certain medications living a keto diet can actually save your life and can can help uh, ward off those seizures but for the average individual we don't know about the long-term effects yet it's a great thing to cycle through from now and again to you know reset the system uh break that addiction to carbohydrates uh get things going but we we don't know enough about its effects on, say, female hormones for a lot of things. Like it doesn't work for for certain females on a long term basis because it changes too much of their um, of their hormone balance. And like we, it's very individual. So I can't say a broad like pro keto or against keto. It's very individualistic, and that's why it's so important to know more about that because. Every single person has a different genetic code, has a different background, has different gut bacteria. And we get into that too. Like the way that you're born affects the gut bacteria you have for the rest of your life. And so, um, yeah, it, it very much comes down to the individual and understanding how to work with them. And is it good for somebody that has hypertension? It can be, but then you also have to think of, we, there's so many other options there or other factors at play. And that's why, um, learning how to take an intake is very important. So going through someone's medical history and family history and their personal history to glean more insights because it's not just, you know, will this fix that? You have to understand more about the person and all of the different things that make them who they are now. Awesome. So great question is um, somebody's asking, is this nutrition course useful for the general population? The title you showed says sports performance, um, which is not a group that they work with. Mm -hmm. So it will be uh, a general overview of, <clears throat> excuse me, of like basic nutritional knowledge, uh, as well as the middle component, uh, sorry, the, we'll be talking about physiology and anatomy and um, genetics. And then the last piece will definitely be more so focused on understanding things like the female athlete triad and going in um, for more of, you know, like how to build muscle, how to sustain, um, how to basically, it will be very useful for the general public, but with a special interest in the last portion of, of working in the fitness industry and coaching clients. Yeah. And then somebody was asking, what's the difference between taking the nutrition course online versus the one that's starting in September? So the I can speak. One I can oh, speak yeah. for it. Um, the, the one online is all uh, self-paced. So that would be something that um, you read the material yourself at your own pace, you go through it. Whereas the one in September that we're running, um, Sydney, um, actually you can speak to that one if you'd like to. Um, mm -hmm. You'll be doing two days a week on Monday and Tuesday nights, I believe. Uh, yes. You'll be doing lectures via webinars, just yes. similar, very doing the same sort of idea as this. Yes. Um, using go to webinar, um, and you'll be teaching for how long? Um, so I do believe the sessions will be two and a half or three hours long on Monday and Tuesday evenings. Uh, we will be going for, I don't remember the exact length of the weeks that we're going for, but the course is much more in depth than the online one. Uh, it's being developed uh, by myself and a naturopath, and we are putting together a, a, a very in-depth course. Um, this will be done via webinar. Uh, you will also be able to see me <laughs> when I do this course, and it will be a great way to discuss and ask questions and get feedback right away whereas the online one is that self-paced version so this one will be easier to have more one-on-one -on -one coaching time if you need it if you have any extra questions uh, we'll be going through case studies all this kind of stuff to help get you prepared 
for what's next for you? That was a great question. Um, sorry, I had somebody else that had a question, uh, Pedram. Pedram, can you ask me that question again? You're asking about Walden Farms. Um, while I'm waiting for him, somebody is asking, are the webinars in class form or can you uh, do that at home too? The webinars would be done at home because they're done by a, um, they're done by the, like, just like this, by a computer. Yeah, so you can do them anywhere in the world. Yeah, you can do them anywhere. So you just, as long as you have a computer. Uh, so somebody's asking me now um, that she's looking for a nutritionist. Do you also do meal plans for individuals? Yes, I do do individual meal plans. And uh, my email is just up here on the uh, screen right now if you have any other questions and you can always send that to me there. I'd love to hear from you. Um, and then the uh, other questions is somebody's asking, just wondering what your opinion is about Walden Farms products. They advertise zero calories, zero sugar. Hmm, I don't, I'm not familiar with Walden Farms. Um, if you send me an email and send me a list of their products, I can give you my feedback, but I, I don't actually know who they are off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Awesome. Um, it, uh, Pedram, if you want to uh, send me that um, by email, I can definitely ask. Um, I can send that to her and see what uh, information we can gather for you. Another one uh, would be, um, should I avoid carbs? <laughs> so that's the new trend right now is, you know, low carb everything, carbs are bad, but that's not necessarily the truth either. So we need to be mindful of um, your situation, what your goals are, um, avoiding carbs in general is probably not the best option for most of the population but being mindful of the amount of carbs the quantity the quality of carbs uh, could be a good place to start if you find that your diet if you're looking at your plate and your plate is you know based of carbohydrates you don't see any type of protein going on you don't see a lot of quality fat then maybe rearranging that plate would be a good option but for the general idea of should I avoid carbs is um, we need to dig deeper into that and it would have to be something that you work with like one-on-one -on -one with someone to understand like the reasoning behind that. Um, so this person's new to eating healthy, where would they start? I think basically everything that we talked about was the perfect way to get into that. Uh, if you're new to eating healthy and you know you're coming off the the junk food bandwagon, just starting by flipping over a package and starting to see where if it's full of refined sugar and making better options there. If you still are eating a lot of packaged food, finding foods that are you know less and less ingredients, real whole food sources or as close to whole food as you can find in a can or in a bag. Uh, is a good place to start and so we start by avoiding things like refined sugar and refined oils uh, is a, the first place to start and then really taking a look at your plate and seeing if you have protein on your plate is your plate is 100 percent carbs um, things like that and when you're starting out it's ideal to pick one or two or maybe three things if you're feeling adventurous and go there because it can be quite overwhelming with there's so much information out there um, to to start by trying to do everything all at once and for most people that's not the right option so choose one or two things to start with and then expand out from there awesome um and the last question um should i do a detox or a juice cleanse because that's a big thing you hear about all the time now yes i get that question all the time um when it comes to like if you're gonna if, there is no yes or no answer, as, as I'm sure you guys are starting to understand. Uh, but when it comes to doing a, a juice cleanse, that's not the, the best option for, for anyone. If you're thinking about juice, juice is 
free of fiber. There's no fiber in it. It's just 100% juice. Um, it can be useful to reset your system if you wanted to, you know, break your addiction to eating. If you find yourself snacking all the time, grazing, eating too much sugar, eating too many carbs, uh, and then, you know, the actual mental component of, of basically fasting with a little bit of juice for a couple of days could be useful. But if you're trying to do that to cleanse your system or to detox your system, there are better ways to do that than, than a juice cleanse, um, particularly because you're, you're getting just too much sugar all at once. Uh, finding a broth cleanse would be an easier way to do it. Um, more so of like the, the herbal or veggie broths instead like of just, yeah, instead of just pure sugar juice would be, would be a good option in my mind. No. Awesome. Any, uh, anybody else have any more questions? Feel free to type them in. Sydney, do you have any other things that you'd like to add to the, to what you've already spoken to? No, I hope that that was helpful for everyone. I hope that, you know, challenges you guys to flip over some labels and steer clear of some of the food advertising that's out there and maybe step that up, share that with someone else. Obviously, you don't want to preach, but uh, share that with someone who might appreciate the information and, and then challenge you to, to see what you can do tomorrow when it goes to the grocery when it comes to the grocery store or what's on your plate and just have a second look before you, you know, fall for, for all of the marketing that's out there in the world. And I hope you guys found that useful. If you guys have any questions at all, please feel free to email me uh, or email us at InfoFetch and we can go forward from there. I hope to see some of you guys in September or hear from you guys online. And thanks, Kathy, for having me. Thank you so much for coming, uh, for, for doing this webinar for us. It was fantastic. I have a lot of great information. And no we'll hopefully look forward to having you again soon in the future for another one. Sounds good.